So tonight we're very excited to have Molly Weisenberg here with us to celebrate the release of her new book, Delancey, A Man, A Woman, A Restaurant, A Marriage. I started reading Molly's blog, Orange Jet, when I was first out of college and building a home on my own. And I remember being captivated by the sincerity in her writing. Reading Orange Jet inspired me to build my home and cook for myself with care and intention. And then about a year later, I had the great delight to host Molly here at the bookstore for her first book, A Homemade Life, and to watch her writing success grow. Through her blog posts and Flickr photos, I followed Molly and Brandon on their journey in the creation of their restaurant, Delancey. And like many of you, have eagerly supported Delancey since its opening. Much like reading her writing, dining at Delancey is an opportunity to relish in a craft done impeccably well. Um, last summer I moved into a buyer position here at the bookstore where I manage our cookbook section and I also buy for Simon & Schuster. So I couldn't have been more happy when I saw, or I could have been happier, excuse me, when I saw <laughs> Molly's memoir, Delancey, um, on my first round of catalogs and I got to buy Delancey for the store. Um, so, <laughs> I don't think I'm alone in saying that I will gleefully devour anything that Molly creates. <laughs> um, so now here we are, May 6th, the release date for Delancey, a man, a woman, a restaurant, a marriage. And I'm once again thrilled to say, please join me in welcoming Molly Weisenberg. <laughs> Hold on. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Or should I pull the mic up a little bit? Oh boy, it doesn't sound good. <laughs> Is that better? Okay. I think that's going to do the job. I'm not going to touch it again. Um, thank you so much for, um, for that introduction, Anna. I remember um, so well my event here five years ago. Um, I think my voice cracked and I almost burst into tears when it came time to actually read from the book. I stupidly picked um, the first chapter of A Homemade Life, which is about my dad, who passed away in 2002. And anyway, um, I can now read it without crying. But um, hopefully I'm going to read a chapter tonight that is not going to um, pose any kind of threat in that department. <laughs> um, anyway, I want to thank all of you for coming out. Um, I know Monday nights are hard. Tuesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Monday nights are hard too. No, um, Tuesday nights are at least a night when I want to be at home. Um, they're usually our Sunday night. So, um, so anyway, thank you all for coming out. Um, my podcasting partner, Matthew Amster Burton, is here. I don't know how many of you listen to our podcast. Gold Night. Anyway, Matthew is here. Bless him, because he has read this book like three times, and he does not need to be here listening to me talk about it. Um, and my husband, Brandon, is also here, and so is... Um Um, and so is our dear friend Carla, without whom we would have never had the courage to open Delancey. Carla is the owner of Cafe Lago. And, um, and my dermatologist is here. <laughs> I, I just want him to see that it worked. It worked. Yeah, I called him like two weeks ago and I was like, my face will not stop breaking out. Like, we need to fix this. Anyway, it worked. Thank you. Okay. So, um, on that note, um, what I really want to do is, um, I sort of want to just cut to the chase, and I, I want to read to you a chapter from the book. Um, I feel like it's hard for me to sort of give you, um, you know, a sort of preface or backstory to, to this book, because the story really is is all in here, and, um, and I think the best introduction to it is the introduction. Um, but what I really want is, um, yeah, I want to get a chance to, to talk with you. So um, my favorite part of coming out and talking about books is getting to take your questions and answer questions and just talk about all of this. So um, keep that in mind, because here in just a second, I am going to want to hear your questions. Um, anyway, so, um, so I finished the first draft of this book um, about two years ago. It feels like um, such an amazing victory to um, finally get to read from it. It has been the world's longest journey. And here I am today. Okay, so um, I'm going to read from the introduction. 
I dug out my wedding vows the other night. I hadn't read them since we got married, and our fifth anniversary is coming up. I wanted to see if I was holding up my end of the deal. Brandon and I each read our own vows, agreeing on just a rough word count and leaving the rest a surprise, and we read them to each other for the first time during the ceremony in front of our assembled families and friends. Wedding vows were made to be said aloud, and when you look at somebody's vows written out, anybody's, even your own, they tend to read like a Hallmark card. In my vows, I told Brandon that he's the best person I know, <laughs> that he's the best person I know, and that when I describe him to someone new, the first thing I always say is, he's so good. It's true. Um, I told him that I love the fact that he whistles constantly without knowing that he's doing it. I love that he's been singing the same Cayetano Veloso song in the shower since we met, and that he still can't get the lyrics right. I love that he's the first person our friends call when they're in trouble. I love that he likes to make people happy. My mother once told me that the reason she fell in love with my father was that she knew she could always learn from him. When I met Brandon, I knew what she meant. Explaining why I love Brandon was easy, but then came the tricky part of the vows, the part where you have to make the kind of promises that actually make you married. I remember the day that I wrote that part because it made me very nervous. Not that that's a real problem, I've always thought that marriage was a fine thing to be nervous about. There's nothing breezy about until death do us part. You're hitching your wagon to someone else's, and if you're totally honest about it, neither of you really knows how the steering column works, which road you'd be smartest to take, and whether somewhere down the road your spouse's wheel hubs will open to reveal blades designed specifically to tear your wagon apart than her style. I see trepidation as a mark of sanity. But that's why I forged ahead and wrote what I did because I knew all of that and still I wanted to get married. So I told him that I would always love him and support him, even though the word always makes me feel like I need an antacid. I wanted to say it, I wanted to believe it. I vowed to work with him to make our hopes and dreams real, whatever they might be, and I meant it. I had already had a preview of Brandon's hopes and dreams. When we met in the spring of 2005, he was 23 and living in New York, and I was 26 and living in Seattle. He was a trained saxophonist and composer with a master's, excuse me, working on a master's degree in composition. I worked in publishing, wrote a food blog, and was slowly extracting myself from a doctoral program that I decided not to finish. We both loved to cook and to eat. Brandon was particularly into espresso. He had three espresso machines and a commercial grade grinder that was larger than some New York kitchens, <laughs> each one carefully researched and purchased on eBay. The first time I took him to meet my mother, he spent an entire afternoon working on my dad's old Faima Contessa, which hadn't been touched in the three years since he had died. A bolt in the housing was stuck, and Brandon wrestled with it for most of an afternoon. When it came loose, he made my mother a cappuccino, and then he grinned for the better part of a week. <laughs> but about a year after we met, when we moved in together in Seattle, he started noticing that caffeine made him feel like the Hulk, like yelling and smashing things and wearing tight purple pants. So he gave up espresso and sold his fancy machines. Instead, he decided he would build violins. He'd always loved the instrument, the romance of it, the sound of it, the fact that it's notoriously difficult to build well. Brandon loves a good problem. He was starting a PhD program in composition at the UW that fall, and he had a job in a restaurant, but building violins, he thought, would be a really nice way to spend his free time. After we settled into our first apartment, he built a workbench from plywood and two-by-fours in the basement. He bought chisels and planes of every size. Whenever we were out in the car, he pulled over at every garage sale shopping for tools. He bought books on violins. He bought a broken violin and broke it even more, studying the way the parts fit together. On Craigslist, he found an ad for a specialized drill, 18 inches long and closely resembling a milkshake blender. And one afternoon, we met up with a guy who was selling it, handed him a few 20s, and heaved it out of the back of his truck. But Brandon didn't build a violin or a fraction of a violin. Once he had understood how to build one, once he'd gone through the steps in his head, once he'd solved that problem, he was satisfied. The tools lay dormant through the winter, and then when summer came around again, Brandon announced a new idea. He was going to build a boat. <laughs> Since moving to Seattle, he had bought himself a membership to the Center for Wooden Boats, and any time he had a few hours free, he'd rent a boat and go out rowing on Lake Union. He wanted to have his own boat someday, and given that such things are not cheap, the best bet he decided was to build one. 
Our friend Sam would help, and they would do it in the backyard of our apartment using plans for a traditional Australian skiff that Brandon had bought online. This was 2007, the summer of our wedding, and it was going to be a very busy summer. But as he pointed out, the boat would be fun for both of us. It would be like a mobile picnic table. <laughs> he knows exactly what I like. Uh, plus, he wouldn't even have to buy any tools. He could just use the stuff he'd bought for the violins. It was perfect. I had no reason to argue, and I looked forward to the picnics. I also looked forward to the ice cream shop that he was going to open. He'd been making ice cream since I met him, since before then, actually, when he spent a few months studying in Paris and lived in an apartment down the street from the famous Bertillon ice cream shop. The first year that we were dating, he bought me an Italian gelato maker for my birthday, one of those buy your partner the gift that you actually want to receive kind of scenarios, even though I, I was very excited about it. Um, and on his next visit, he christened it with a batch of bourbon spiked pear sorbet. But by the, and, excuse me, and by the time he moved to Seattle, he was well on his way to perfecting his favorite ice cream flavor, salted caramel. He'd noticed that Seattle didn't have a great local ice cream company like Bertillon or San Francisco's Byright. So he began to think, hey, you know, I could do something about that. So when he wasn't reading up on boat design, he researched local health code regulations, methods, and industrial grade machines. But he didn't build the boat or open the ice cream shop. Brandon and I got married, and then we went on a honeymoon to Vancouver Island, and then summer was over. I had left my publishing job and was writing my first book, a memoir about growing up in a food-loving family and losing my dad. Brandon was in his second year of a PhD program, working as a teaching assistant, leading music classes two days a week at a Montessori elementary school, teaching on Saturday mornings at a conservatory program for teenagers, and still working at a local restaurant. We were happy, working hard, learning how to be adults, trying to figure out what it meant to be married. Things were humming along. And then one night that fall, over a late dinner at our friend Carla's restaurant that ended with us dancing to Blondie in the darkened, empty dining room, Brandon and Carla hatched the idea of opening a pizza place. A pizza place? What we had here was definitely a giant violin. <laughs> or maybe, at the most, a picnic boat offering ice cream by the scoop. A little over a year later, our friend Sam took a picture of us. Brandon is on the ladder in what is now the kitchen of Delancey, tiling the face of the wood-burning oven. I'm standing below him, holding a power drill. He looks tired, a little worried, possibly in mid-sentence. I'm staring at something outside the frame, absolutely expressionless. But I know what I was thinking. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's how it got started. Um, Anyway, <laughs> so who wants to know what happened after that? <laughs> no, really, I would be happy to take any, any questions. How many, how many of you here have been to Delancey? Whoa, that's fantastic, awesome. Um, do you have any questions for me? Yes? At what point in the, the creation of the restaurant did you decide you were going to write about it? Um, well, hi, Wendy. Good to see you. Um, I, you know, that's really interesting because um, I think that once I was really in the thick of helping him with it, I realized that I, that there was like too much, so much crazy stuff going on, I needed to write it down, um, if only to help me make sense of it. Um, but I, I think I didn't have the courage to actually think that I could do it or to see how the whole story fit together um, until it had been open for um, maybe almost two years. So it took me a while too. I mean, part, part of, um, I mean, this book served a real purpose for me in helping me to be able to see, to see our story clearly. Because, you know, when I met Brandon, I thought, I thought he was a composer, and um, and you know it, it's it's that thing of you know when you fall in love with someone and when you marry someone you have no idea who they're going to actually turn out to be down the line, and um, and I think I had really firm expectations on who he was going to be, and um, and I had a really hard time letting that go. You guys are so quiet. <laughs> yes. Will you tell me a little bit about the intersection of the and everything else that you're 
Yeah. Um, so, um, so Brandon. Oh, sure. So the question was, um, can I talk a little bit about the intersection of becoming a parent and and all of this other work? Or, okay. Um, so Brandon and I had our first child uh, almost two years ago, about 20 months ago. Um, and uh, actually, at the time that I at the time that I first started writing this book, at the time that I was writing the proposal for this book, I didn't even know that I wanted to have a baby. Um, it was a very um, a quick switch for me, and um, and I feel like the restaurant in many ways helped prepare me for it. Um, I remember when we were opening the restaurant, um, a lot of people said, "Oh, that sounds like having a newborn," you know, like it just it needs and it needs and it needs, um, and uh, and yeah, that's that's how it was early on for the restaurant for sure, um, and so I, I feel like. Um, some of the things that, that writing this book helped me to understand about, about our story and, and our process of becoming small business owners when that was you know, not at all what I thought we would be. I thought Brandon was going to be a professor of music and I thought, I don't know, that I would lead some sort of quiet life writing books or something. Um, I didn't expect to have the very sort of public thing that is a restaurant. And um, I feel like th that um, having to having to sort of learn how to accommodate and find the good part of a life that I didn't think fit me well um, has helped me a lot as a parent. Because um, while I, I do often say to people that I feel like our daughter is sort of exactly the right person for us, um, boy, like learning how to be a parent is um, a huge role to grow into. Um, I have definitely gone through all, so I've, I've been writing my blog for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years this July. And when I started it, the, you know, the reasons why I started it, they're, they're very different from the reasons why I keep doing it. I mean, I started it because I was a graduate student who um, really had sort of only been writing for professors for many years at that point. And I really kind of wanted a place to figure out why I was so interested in food and to get back to sort of writing, doing writing that I wanted to do. And, um, and I never expected it to lead to my getting to write a book, much less two. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, definitely over time I've had a lot of moments of thinking, why am I still doing this? Um, it, it's, it's a tremendous amount of work and it is, um, it's a commitment that sometimes feels like a lot of pressure. But at the same time, um, I feel like it's taken me a long time to realize this, but I think the best thing about, <coughs> about blogs is that they, um, they, that we make sort of an agreement with our readers. You know, we're going to keep showing up if, if they keep showing up. And for, for me as a writer, that is a really wonderful thing that keeps me going because um, as, as I think, most of us who have tried to do any writing, whether it was, you know, like a school paper or something personal, writing is really hard, even for those of us who claim to like to do it. And, um, and so for me, blogging helps me continue to show up and, um, and just helps me keep practicing. So, um, so yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, I mean, I fall in and out of love with it all the time. And I have no idea what the lifespan of a blog will be or should be. I don't think I'll be doing it forever, but I still really love it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your culinary inspirations and, uh, not aspirations, but inspirations, and um, why pizza? Yeah. So um, I'm going to start with why pizza. Um, so when I met Brandon, he was living in New York. I was here. and. Um, and our sort of early dating time was long distance. And whenever I would go visit him, we would spend a lot of time eating pizza because he was, you know, he had grown up eating really great pizza. That's something that I, I had no concept of. I grew up in Oklahoma where, you know, it was like we just had dominoes. Um, and so, so 
I just had no idea that that you could even look at pizza the way he did. That you could find the like the nuance in it that he that he could see in it. Um, he grew up just outside of New York City, and New Jersey has so many great pizza places. I mean, as does New York. Um, and so when he moved here in 2006, we spent a lot of time eating pizza all over the place. And um, and there are a lot of Neapolitan pizza places that have sprung up around Seattle, but that's a very different style from New York style. It's it's much thinner. It's kind of softer. Um, it's it's wetter. And Brandon really missed the pizza that he had grown up eating. And so, um, so he decided to teach himself how to make it. And so that is how we, you know, I, I feel like, I, I think I can speak for both of us in saying that, that everything that, that we've done, whether it's like my writing or you writing music or you doing pizza, like that we're trying to do the work that we want to consume ourselves. And so, um, so that's how he got into pizza, because we wanted to be able to eat really good pizza. <laughs> um, and then as for culinary inspirations, um, I feel like um, I have learned so much. I, I, I grew up in the, in the early days of the Food Network, you know, like the late 90s was when, I, when I was a teenager, and I spent a lot of time watching the Food Network. But I feel like most of what I know about cooking I learned from a lot of really just classic cookbooks, um, like Julia Child's book, How to Cook, um, The Joy of Cooking. I mean, that was like my first cookbook. I feel like, you know, it doesn't sound very inspirational, but those are the books that got me cooking right off the bat, that, that gave me, I, I feel like the, um, the purpose of a recipe should always be to teach us how to cook something so that hopefully the next time we go to make it we don't need the recipe and I feel like those those sort of foundational books really do that so yeah Molly I loved your um, your contributions even to Bon Appetit magazine you were in there every issue and yeah still have some of your recipes I was wondering if you ever saw yourself continuing writing the so the, the question was about a column that I used to write for Bon Appetit. I wrote it from, I think, 2008 to 2011. And, uh, and whether I would you know, write for them again or whether I foresee that happening. I, you know, I don't know. So part of what, what, well, what marked the ending of my column is that, um, as I'm sure those of you who are subscribers noted, the magazine changed tremendously in 2011. They got a new editor-in-chief, and I think basically all but two staff members left or were laid off. Um, and so the whole magazine shifted. I think it's, I mean, I, I love it. It's my favorite food magazine. Um, and I really love what they've done with it. But my, you know, my relationships there are not the same. The editors I worked with, they aren't there. And, um, and so much of, of, being able to write for magazines is having, building relationships with editors. And um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I love what they're doing. You were a great contribution. Thank you. I loved doing it. I, I, I sort of, the, my column was called Cooking Life. And um, I basically set it as a challenge to myself to, to force me to try cooking things that I wasn't really comfortable with or didn't know how to cook. Like, because I was just doing it once a month, I could spend a lot of time on these recipes. Um, anyway, so, you know, like pate and mayonnaise and things that I was really daunted by. Um, it was really good, a good kick in the pants to have to learn how to do it. So, did, did you have your hand yeah. raised? So, I'm becoming a couples therapist, and I was wondering what, um, like, maybe one or, one or two of the biggest challenges you and Brandon faced in an early marriage and opening a business, and what your biggest strengths were as a couple that kind of got you through. Um, well, so, so Brandon first started talking about the idea of opening this restaurant three months after we got married. So we were, you know, we were very new, very newly married and we had only known each other for about two and a half years. And I think that there was a lot I didn't know about him um, and, and his capabilities. Um, you know, I didn't know that he had a, a mind for business. I didn't know that he had the kind of tenacity that he has to stand in front of a, you know, 700 degree wood burning oven five nights a week and make every pizza we served for the first four and a half years we were open. He's just started taking one, sometimes two nights off. 
Um, but anyway, I didn't know that about him. And so um, I feel like, you know, a lot of the things that we were, a lot of the struggles that we had around Delancey were, um, you know, we have this dynamic in our relationship where Brandon is kind of the big dreamer and I'm sort of the anchor or like the break to put it in like a not so fun kind of way. And I feel like if anything, um, it was really an important exercise for me in letting go a little bit and, and trusting him a little bit more. Um, and, and also um, learning to recognize in each other what our strengths are. I think that one of the hardest things um, about the early days of the restaurant is we were on such a tiny budget, we didn't have the money to hire a prep cook. And so we were both there, <coughs> my throat is really dry. We were both there between 15 and 17 hours a day. And we were both doing kind of everything because everything needed to be done. But we were doing, we were having to do a lot of things that we weren't good at. And, you know, of course, most of that is because we didn't have the money to pay somebody else who could do it better and who knew what they were doing to do it. But, um, but another thing is I think we hadn't really figured out what our strengths were within the business and what we could both bring to it. And, and just going through the, just taking the time and being patient with it and just keeping moving ahead allowed us to um, to make enough money to hire a prep cook, thank goodness, so that we could start like sleeping in till maybe like eight sometimes. Um, and also um, just starting to delegate. I mean, I, 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 I say at one point in the book um, something that Brandon and I have talked about many times, which is that um, I feel like the most loving thing that he has ever done for me is to not teach me how to make the pizza. Because, um, because I can't deal with the, the pressure of a restaurant kitchen. Um, you know, you have to be you know, able to really thrive in a, an adrenaline-fueled situation, under pressure, um, and Brandon knows that that wouldn't be good for me. And so I feel like that was a huge moment in our relationship that we could start to acknowledge and not disparage each other's shortcomings but like start to focus on what each of us does well. Yeah. Um, going back to a previous question, what are your food aspirations? <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh, my food aspirations. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I've never been much of a goal setter. Um, yeah, that's Brandon's job. Brandon, what are your aspirations? Now? Um, Brandon, do you have aspirations? Okay. Um, no, I feel like at this point, um, I feel like you know my my mind has obviously been warped by having a child. Um, I mean, in good ways. But um, I feel like uh, my, my biggest goal at this point around food and around sort of what I want my family life to be around food and my everyday experience of food to be is something that I learned from my friend Matthew and his wife Lori who have um, a really wonderful approach to eating as a family. And that's that um, I just hope that as a family that food can always be something that we can share free of strife and that it can always be a common ground for us. And I, I hope to not pick stupid fights with June about, about food. <laughs> I just want it to be something that, that um, yeah, a way that we can play together. Yeah. So you're about to launch this book tour. I think we are all lucky enough to be the first of this book tour. How do you keep it fresh? So you've got 12 days on the road, umpteen stops. <laughs> I don't know if you're reading the same intro each one or not. I mean, obviously the questions change up, but I think part of what people fall in love with about you is that you're so authentic and you're so real and you sort of give voice to the things that aren't spoken. So how do you, how do you keep, kind of keep, keep it fresh and keep it authentic on, on this sort of road show? I have no idea. <laughs> I, d I actually don't know what I'm going to read at the other ones, so maybe that's a good thing. Um, I think the, the other thing is that, um, well, part of what I am really enjoying about talking about this book is um, 
so you know, my my first book, I feel like I sort of sneaked up on the story. I, I didn't I didn't know how to write a book. I had been given this wonderful opportunity by this editor who believed I could do it, and I wrote it completely out of order because that was the only way I could figure out how to do it was just to sort of tiptoe around these stories and then sort of weave them together later. And but that meant that then when I got out and started talking to people about it, I had a little bit of a hard time figuring out what it was a book about. And I know that that's like the basic thing you're supposed to know, right, <laughs> in writing a book. But um, it made it such that sometimes it was really difficult to, to talk about the book, to get to the point, to not talk forever. Um, this book, because part of the, 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 the fun for me in writing this book was trying to figure out what, like, how it was that we came to own a restaurant, like trying to understand that story for myself. I feel like every time I talk about it, I learn something new about it. And, um, and I mean, I'm not exaggerating either. Um, I just, um, I, I did an interview with Ross Reynolds from KUOW the other day, and he asked such good questions. I mean, he's a total pro. Um, but I just came out of it feeling like, wow, I just figured out a whole bunch of things about this book. Um, and so, so I feel like that is, for me, that's part of, um, yeah, that's what drew me to writing this story. And part of what so far is making it a pleasure to talk about is that, um, that, that yeah, it's a story about a, a really brief part of, or really, you know, compressed time in my life but a time when sort of everything was shifting. And, um, and yeah, I'm still putting those pieces down. Yeah. You've described your husband as a dreamer, and I see that in the blog as you're writing. And yet a restaurant is a huge anchor and a huge commitment. And you can't just go, now I want to go sell ice cream mm -hmm. or go sail the Pacific. How do you manage that? Well, so what I didn't know about him when I was seeing, you know, when, when I was seeing in my mind this chain of events, you know, like super into espresso, stops drinking espresso, gonna, you know, build a violin, build a boat. What I didn't see was, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him very well at that time. And I think I thought that I did, you know, like you, you, I, I had known him for like two years. I had known him well enough to know that I wanted to marry him, but like, we were really young. He was 25 when we got married. And, you know, I think that um, it, it is hard to see your own youth when you're in it, and it's hard to see what you don't know when you don't know it. And so um, I, I think that I failed to note that, that there was a difference between his hobbies and things that he would be passionate about for life. And I think that, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I think that he too has been a little bit surprised by how consuming pizza has been. And by the fact that even after making the better part of 100,000 pizzas now, that he still feels like he's learning things about how to do it better and how to do it the way that he wants to do it. And, and I think that, you know, I, I certainly, I hoped that that would be the case that it would be like the ultimate problem for him to solve, the unsolvable problem. <laughs> and I think it is, I think it is. And I think the other thing is, you know, restaurants never hold still. Like there's always something breaking, you know, you'll have a staff member who's moving away to graduate school, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I think that even though it gives us a lot of heartache at times, and it is a bit of an anchor, you know, we can't just, you know, leave town whenever we want or whatever. Um, at the same time, I feel like um, it's a challenge that's, that's really good for him and learning how to live with that challenge has been really good for me. Um, yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sorry, 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 okay. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wondered what, obviously, your life is um, very busy with all these Yourself with all that's going on. So um, there has been a, a 
very surprising upside to, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so the question was, um, given the, the, the apparent busyness of my life, what do I do to sort of recharge or, um, did that act? yes, okay. Um, so at the time that we were talking about starting the restaurant, all I could see about it is that it meant that, um, that I wouldn't get to have dinner with my spouse anymore. Um, which had been a huge part of our, our dating and our early marriage. Um, it felt like a huge threat that, um, that that ritual that most people have in their lives was not going to be in my life. And even though, you know, yeah, we can have breakfast together. I mean, I think, I think everybody can relate to the fact that, that like a new day starts and like suddenly there's stuff in your inbox and, you know, there's something going on and it's not, um, it's very different to spend time with your loved ones at the beginning of the day versus the end of the day. And so I, I really worried about that. And the truth is, is um, I feel like actually um, the restaurant has created a wonderful lifestyle for both of us in that um, Brandon gets a lot of time with our daughter during the daytime um, and and we get time together during the daytime, but then I get time alone each night. Um, so you know I don't get to I, I get to eat dinner with Brandon two or three nights a week. Um, but you know I've always loved to cook alone. I, I wrote a lot about that in my first book, and it's a very sort of like grounding feeling for me. So I get to cook alone, which granted, you know, it's not as fun to eat alone as it is to eat with someone else, but I do like to cook alone. And I get like two or three hours to myself at night after my daughter goes to bed. And that is pretty awesome. And that's something that I never expected um, when I thought about what it would be like to have a child and have a family. I just thought like, excuse me, to have a child and have a restaurant. I just thought like kids, restaurants, like this doesn't work. But um, I've been really surprised that it does. Yeah, all the, all the way in the back there. Um, were there any turning points in the life of a restaurant that enabled it to be as popular as it was? Can you think of any at all that that had to happen? So the question is, check it out, Anna. I remember. Uh, the question is, um, were there any turning points in sort of the the life of the restaurant that allowed it to become popular or that sort of sealed its success. I, I feel like a, a huge um, part of what has made Delancey what it is is the fact that Brandon has, has been there and has been so physically present and so invested in it because he has really set the tone. I mean, he, if he's in there working every night, he wants to be in an, envir in an environment that he enjoys spending time in. And so, um, so he has really created sort of the culture of what it feels like to work there and, and I think to eat there. I mean, we want it to be a really warm, welcoming place that serves delicious food and, and Brandon was the first person to articulate that. So, I mean, not to be cheesy, but I, I do think he's sort of the backbone of it. Yes. So the, the question is about Essex, which is the bar that we opened next door to Delancey in 2012 and how that sort of fits into all of this. Um, when we were looking at spaces for what is now Delancey, there were three storefronts open on that street and, um, and we were told by the landlord when we were looking around that one of them had already been claimed, that it had been claimed by a woman who owned an umbrella shop. And um, anyway, some of you may have seen it. She's since moved to Pike Place Market. It's called Bella Umbrella. Um, it's been hugely successful. She has beautiful umbrellas. Um, anyway, but she was um, in that space next door to the Delancey Dining Room for the first two and a half years that we were open. And Brandon had the foresight to put into our lease a clause saying that you know we wanted sort of first right of refusal if that space should come up for lease because we didn't know, you know, maybe we would want to expand or who knows. And as it happened, when she decided to move, the timing was, actually in retrospect, the timing was really bad <laughs> for us to open Essex. Um, I was 
I was uh, like four months pregnant, I think, when we found out that she was moving. And um, so we decided to jump on it and to, um, rather than expanding Delancey, because as it is, um, you know, Brandon can only cook so many pizzas at a time. And so we really can't seat many more people and actually accommodate them in a timely way. So I don't, I don't foresee us ever expanding Delancey, but we put in Essex next door as a way of creating a place for people to have a delicious drink if they were hanging out and waiting for a table for Delancey, and also as a place for us to be able to serve some foods that hadn't really fit on the Delancey menu. Um, we wanted to be doing more wood oven roasted vegetables, more wood oven roasted meats, and they're just, it just wasn't fitting within Delancey. And so Essex was sort of a great excuse for, um, for Brandon to sort of geek out on, on all that. We now have a second wood burning oven um, <laughs> crammed into the very tiny Delancey kitchen. So all the food for Essex and Delancey, Essex has a full menu. So all the food for Essex and Delancey um, comes out of that tiny kitchen. Um, and we make a lot of our liqueurs from scratch um, and age things in house as well, age liqueurs and, and blends. Um, so anyway, it's been really fun. I feel like it has given um, I feel like it has given us a whole new new challenge um, and given Brandon a whole new way to geek out on making things. Brandon really loves to like make things from scratch. So um, you know, between making bitters and liqueurs and um, and now, you know, doing a whole menu out of a second wood-burning oven. It's been pretty fun. Um, yes? Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, I really enjoy reading your blog, and I enjoyed your first book, and I have a strong feeling I like the second book. But I want to mention that I'm actually very conservative with my compliments, and um, and that says a lot in, to me. Uh, to me. Um, that it, I mean, I'm not only talking about the stories that you're telling or the recipes that you're sharing, but how you share those um, recipes and how you tell your stories. Um, I want to know how you write. Do you just sit and write and then do a little bit of editing, or you ponder like, every word you're going to put on the paper, or the virtual paper? Um, so what is the process? And also, um, the second part is, so what do you like reading, and um, yeah. what inspires you in terms of writing. Okay. So, um, so the question was sort of what's my process in terms of writing and then also who do I enjoy reading and, and whose work inspires me. Um, so my writing process um, is painful. Um, no, it's, um, so when I started the blog um, and with my first book, I I would sort of use a recipe as kind of a springboard. Like I, I didn't, I felt like I couldn't write if I didn't have a recipe to write about. And that was sort of like where the story came from. And, um, and when I set out to write this book, I wanted to learn how to write a different way. And so I actually really struggled in, in getting started with this book um, because I couldn't figure out where the food fit in it because this was about a time in our lives when we actually weren't cooking very much. Um, so my process for writing this book was really different from, from the blog, where I do still tend to be pretty recipe focused, although I've been having a lot of fun lately just sort of um, using photographs as kind of more of a, a prompt. Um, but writing this book, um, I, I basically sat down and sort of made, I got a whole stack of index cards, and I wrote little phrases on the index cards. Um, about like you know some little anecdote I didn't want to forget, um, and sometimes it was something as tiny as um, there was a little kid who once came into Delancey, and um, as he was leaving, he told Brandon that the pizza was like an atomic bomb of flavor in his mouth. <laughs> and so I wrote that down on an index card because I was like, okay, I don't, I, you know, I want to, I, I, I want to try to work this in somewhere. It, it's actually not in the book. Um, <laughs> But um, I wrote down all kinds of tidbits like that, big and small. And then I kind of started trying to write from those tidbits. And it became apparent pretty quickly which things fit and could have like, fit into a broader story. Sometimes the tidbits sort of showed the way to a chapter for me. 
Um, and about halfway through, I was able to actually map out the book, which is something I wasn't able to do for my first book. And so I had a series of, I think, 26 index cards and, um, and just wrote on each of them sort of what the chapter was about. And then I did this very satisfying thing, and that was each time I would finish a, finish a chapter, I would just cross that index, like put a big X on the index card. Um, so, so yeah, so this, this book I really wrote in a very linear way. I'm a pretty slow writer. Um, I'm pretty careful with which words I use. Um, but I, I tried to um, just keep moving along and then let my wonderful friend Matthew be my first writer and help me tighten it up a bit. Who are your readers? Oh, right. OK. Um, so uh, some authors who I really enjoy reading. Um, I, so, so someone who um, just won, won his first James Beard Award, a guy named Francis Lamb, who I first encountered when he wrote for Gourmet. Um, and he's now gone on to, to write for a number of other sites. He's currently working as um, an editor at large for uh, Clarkson Potter, which is a publisher that does a lot of great cookbooks. Um, but anyway, you can find some of his work on medium.com. He sometimes writes in Bon Appetit. His last name is spelled L-A-M. And um, Francis has, you can really tell that Francis loves people. Like, he's really interested in people. And he does a wonderful job of, um, of giving food a human face and about really, I, that sounds really, <laughs> I mean like those picture books where you turn your bell pepper into a little smiley face. No, Francis, um, he's a wonderful storyteller. I will leave it at that. Now, um, I also really enjoy Calvin Trillin, um, both his writing about food and his writing about everything. Um, I love Michael Shaben. I think my very favorite book of all time is Michael Shaben's first novel, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, which was his master's thesis. So, anyway, okay. Yes? How did you get the inspiration for Essex and Delancey, the names? Oh, um, so how did we get the inspiration for the names Delancey and Essex? So Delancey was a um, sort of arduous process. We had a lot of names that we thought about. We wanted it to be something that was evocative of New York because that was where Brandon was living when we met and that, you know, even though he grew up in New Jersey, that was sort of like where he had come into his pizza awareness, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, anyway, so we wanted something that was evocative of New York. We wanted something actually that was connected to the pizzeria De Fara which um, was Brandon's very favorite place when we first met. And it is in a part of Brooklyn called Midwood. Um, and it is at Avenue J and East 13th. So we played around with all kinds of things for a while. Brandon really wanted to call the restaurant Midwood, <laughs> which a number of our friends kind of vetoed. Um, anyway, and then we thought about Avenue J, but that musical, like it was at Avenue Q or something. It was, it was on the road then, and that just seemed all wrong. And East 13th kind of didn't mean anything. And so finally, I think we just sat down and looked at a map. And um, the word Delancey felt right. And Brandon also had really good memories of being, um, of like taking the subway from the Delancey Street stop after visiting some friends who lived in that part of town. You know, he would often find himself at that subway stop and um, had good memories of it. So that was how Delancey came to be. And then when we were trying to figure out what to name this bar next door, I don't even remember what the other options were. Do you? <laughs> um, it was actually um, one of one of the servers who who worked at Delancey who came up with the name, right? It was Danielle, um, and she suggested it because um, because Delancey and Essex streets intersect, and Delancey Street subway station, um, it, it, Delancey and Essex subway stations are they basically share a station? It's kind of confusing. Um, like underground, you can walk between the two of them. Um, anyway, and it was kind of fitting because our Delancey and our Essex share a back hallway and two bathrooms and a kitchen, and so anyway, it was just right. 
Well, thank you all. This was such a pleasure.